The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Oh, welcome. Uh, my name is Derek Carter. This is Acme, a user interface for programmers. A little bit about myself. I am a infrastructure consultant. I do Linux consulting, uh, bringing up your basic infrastructure, uh, installation servers, configuration management, so on and so forth. If you have needs with help with that, come up and see me afterwards. You can also contact me. It's Derek at Goosebach.com. I'm Goosebach everywhere else. And Goosebach.com slash contact will get you this exact page. So if you need to get a hold of me, you can. Um, sometime toward the end of the day, this presentation.goosebach.com will be live with a copy of this um, presentation in its full form. So you have all the sources of everything we've talked about and, uh, and everything else. So let's start by asking, uh, what is Acme? Uh, it's, an, it's a user interface. Okay, isn't it just an editor? Not entirely. Well, then it's an IDE. Uh, not entirely. Um, a user interface, I'll, I'll get to that in just a minute. It's, uh, we gotta do a little history here. Um, Acme is the editor from the Plan 9 from Bell Labs distribution. Editor slash shell slash user interface uh, is what the, the, the actual um, man page or, or paper that this describes uh, Acme is entitled. Um, what is Plan 9? Well, Plan 9 is best described by its motto, Unicibus Ipsus Unicor, of the Unixes, most Unix-like. It is the successor to Unix, written by Bell Labs, and it took those paradigms that Unix started, you know, like everything's a file, plain text, do one thing well, uh, those sorts of things, to its logical end, right? It, they, they took the things that Unix couldn't quite accomplish, and um, it, it, it essentially boiled down to um, Unix is a 60s style technology that we've kind of just made, you know, iteratively better until we get to today and we've got Linux and Unix and there's been awesome stuff done with that, but it's still based on those philosophies from the 60s. So the people who wrote Unix, they said, well, here we are at 1990, we have new hardware, we have new baselines of things we can deal with. What if we were to reinvent Unix today? And they use the same things. Everything is a file. But in Plan 9, literally everything is a file. There's no longer services or things that are hidden behind black boxes. If you wanted to create a new TCP session, you go into a directory, de, uh, slash net, slash TCP, slash new, and that will create a new TCP session. Everything is done with files. Why am I telling you this? It's important to know how to control Acme, and we're gonna get into that later. Um, that being said, Plan 9, and therefore by association Acme, is a giant paradigm shift. If your synapses aren't burning by the end of this talk, you probably weren't paying attention. And you'll go, oh, that's interesting. Oh, I think I get it. I think I get it. You don't. Um, let, I, I use this example. You've all seen the learning curve diagrams, right? So here's the, the, the learning curve for nano. You learn what the commands are or what that little caret means at the bottom of the screen, and voila, you've mastered nano. Uh, you look at Vim, and uh, the Vim learning curve looks somewhat like this, right? So I learn a new trick, I learn a new trick, 
uh, Acme. If you're familiar with Plan 9 or you like the Unix idea of doing things and you want to learn some of the, the, the Plan 9-esque tools, there's a, a project called Plan 9 Port. So Plan 9 Port, or P9P as it's known, is the user land from Plan 9 ported to Mac, Linux, and I think Windows? I'm not certain on Windows, but it's it's a port of the user space tools from Plan 9, which include Acme. And there's another one called the Acme standalone, uh, standalone concept, standalone, what's that now? Complex. Standalone complex, yes, standalone complex, which is a fully packaged Acme and the environment with which it needs to run. Um, with Acme, there's a couple of things you need to keep in mind. Um, everything is text. Everything is a file. That is important, and we'll see why a little later. Let's look at what Acme looks like. So this is the Acme window. If you open it up in a directory, you run the Acme command, you're going to get something similar to this. You're going to get two columns, you're going to get a header row. The color scheme has been determined using science. Um, there's no opinions in it. Uh, the interface is very minimalistic, but the user interface for Plan 9 was done scientifically using which color looks better, A or B? Which font looks better, A or B? And surveyed, I don't know how many people, but what I'm trying to get at is if you want to customize this to make it your own, you're going to be editing the source code. There is no Acme RC directory that lets you fiddle with the background color of this and the font of that. You can choose a font, uh, but you're not going to get to change the, the way it looks because it's, it's, it's a scientifically, it, it's Think of it as the way that Steve Jobs thinks about how you should use your hardware. The developers of Acme think that that's how you should use an editor. All right, so I'm going to force you to use it this way because trust me, it is better. Question? What we're looking at right now, the SAC version? Uh, what we are looking at now is the um, Plan 9 port version. So I'm running Plan 9 port under Mac OS uh, and it's running full screen. So this is a, uh, uh, the, the question is what we're looking at. This is. Acme running under Plan 9 port. Okay. Plan 9 port takes over the machine? No, it's, it just runs as user space. So it's, it's, you, you, it's a port of the user space tools. Uh, and then the back end, the, the, there's a shim layer that, uh, that Plan 9 port uses to communicate with the kernel layer of your appropriate op operating system. So you compile it for your platform. Um, but it, this is it. Uh, we have. Uh, a file browser, quote unquote, in this window. And the reason we can tell it's a file browser um, is that the beginning, which tells us the file name, ends in a slash. So if it's a directory file name, this is the directory. Then we have a couple of commands. These commands cannot be edited. Anything after the pipe, however, can be. We'll get into how to do that in just a minute. And then you have the actual content. So this is the content of the directory, blah, 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 blah. This is the column header with a bunch of commands. And here's an empty column with an empty buffer. Or actually, here is an, well, yes, it is an empty, an empty buffer. I can type stuff here. Hi, this is cool. If I wanted to save it, I actually have to enter the commands into the tag is what it's called. This is the tag. And I do that by creating a file name such as, uh, well, I'm just going to copy and paste this directory real quick. And I'm going to give it a file name of foo.txt. And um, so this is the file name that I want it to have. And I'm going to execute the command put, which is save. And now if I go over here and execute the command get, 
which says load the directory, I get the, the file to drop into that directory. That's the basics of Acme. Um, so it's a, it's a text editor. There's no syntax highlighting. There's, uh, there's no spell checker. There's uh, save, open, close, exit. That's all that Acme gives you out of the box. Anything else you want to build, you can build it yourself. But lucky for us, it's just Unix pipes, and we can do all sorts of fun stuff with it. A couple other little pieces here. Uh, these little boxes will let you, um, let me uh, open uh, a couple other windows here. So I can open multiple files, and it uses a tiling paradigm. These little boxes here let me control how big things are. Uh, I can hide it by clicking different mouse buttons and bring it back. I can move it from side to side. See, I can do all sorts of fun stuff like that. But yeah, that's the basics. Um, one thing about what I'm doing, you're gonna want a three button mouse and preferably a three button mouse that has a button that is not also the scroll wheel. Hard to come by, and oh, that is very, very washed out. This is a Lenovo IntelliPoint mouse. I don't remember the name. Uh, I'll modify this slide with a link to the Amazon uh, entry for it. It's 25 bucks or something. It's, it's, if you're gonna get into Acme, you're gonna want this mouse. It scrolls X and Y, and the buttons, uh, this is probably a little easier to see, the buttons uh, are one, two, three at the top, and then the scroll points in the middle. Very, very cool. Um, there's a couple of guys uh, that I know that actually have some track balls that work very well as well. So the, uh, the thing is, is the, the track ball has three buttons and the pointer and a scroll mechanism. I don't know how he does it, but there's another one that's really good with that. Um, button clicks. So you saw me doing a couple of things. Button one is the left button. By default, it just places the cursor. Button two is the middle button. And it does a little bit of double duty, but most often it's for executing. So when I get in here and I want to save the file, you'll notice that it doesn't have anything for me to save it yet because it doesn't say put right there. But if I modify the buffer, two things happen. This little block turns purple. It says it's a dirty buffer. And then it puts the put command into the tag. I put my mouse over the put command, which is just Unicode text. There's nothing fancy about anything. It's the, the fact that the command is capital P-U-T makes Acme do the put operation on the buffer. So I click the middle button, or button two, and that executes the put command. It is no longer a dirty buffer, so it no longer needs the put command in the tag, and it's no longer dirty on the little icon in the corner. Button three, um, this is an introduction to Acme, and we don't have two weeks, so uh, I'm just gonna tell you that it does stuff. Um, and this, the, the, the magic of button three is when you're just coming around and getting the momentum back from that, that, that learning curve when you're swooping back around is when you learn the, the magic of button three. And honestly, uh, this finger right here knows more than this about what button three does. I can't explain it, but I can do it when I need it to happen. So we're just gonna hand wave that away for a second and, and say that button three does stuff. Most often it's known as plumbing. We'll get into what plumbing is in just a second. Mouse cords. This is the thing that's gonna fry your brain. Uh, and watching an Acme guru uh, just fly through the screen, double clicking, triple clicking, click, 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 and button cords. There is no cut and paste. There is no copy and paste, really, in Acme without using cording. So in order to do a 
copy and paste, you need to do the following. I drag button one, and I do not let go of it. So I have button one depressed. I press button two. That is a cut. I have not let go of button one. I then press button three, and it pastes what was snarfed, is the command they use, um, back. And then I let go of button one, and I have the ability to reposition my cursor. And to paste, I press button one to position my cursor, and I press button three to paste. Again, button one is left, button two is middle, button three is right. Mouse cording. That's your first mouse cord, is a copy and paste. Advanced mouse cording, um, honestly, I don't quite understand it myself. Uh, all I know is that it does some really cool stuff. Um, there's a, a two plus one, swipe three, there's, you know, just, it does radical magical stuff. Uh, there's one that does execute this, wherever it happens to be. There's another one that does plumb this, whatever it happens to be. I'm gonna get into plumbing, just a second. And you can plumb and or execute with options if you do it a different way. Which I, I, I still kind of don't understand it myself. Um, I'm hoping that I will uh, sometime soon so I can explain it to people because it does make your day go a little faster. So let's talk about plumbing. Um, I want you to think of a time that you've been editing a file. Who here has been editing a file, say a program or something, and they run make and GCC or whatever it is spits out a, there's an error on line blah. Anyone seen that? Right? What do you have to usually do once you see that? You go back to your editor, you run the editor's command, whatever that happens to be, to get you to that line, and uh, it causes you all sorts of grief. Um, let me show you here one little trick of what plumbing does. Um, and it's, it's really, uh, oops. I'm gonna just create a, this, let's see here. Echo, this is line one. Echo, this is line two, and then so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, echo, dollar sign zero, colon, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. And then I will do another echo, hi. I'm going to put this, I'm going to go over here to my terminal. It works, right? So whatever our output would be, I can copy and paste this or go into my editor and try to figure out how to get to line seven. Um, but really what I wanna do is uh, I want to have a terminal over here so that I can run it under Acme. So what I do is I run the command win, wherever I wanna put it. I can put it here, I can put it here, I can put it here. I'm gonna put it up here, type it in, W-I-N, middle click to execute it, and what that does is it puts a prompt, a, a shell, inside my editor. So I can do sh, 
example.sh. It does the output. And because I have the plumber running, I button three click or right click on this. Do you see what happened there? So here I am. I'm, uh, let's say I highlight this line. I go back to my output and I right click on example.sh colon seven. It moves my mouse from here to here and selects the entire line. Slick, no? Very slick. That's not all. But wait, there's more. You can also plumb with regular expressions. So um, let's look at that. Uh, let me just go over here and, and do um, example.sh colon caret line. Of course, it's going to find it there, but if I do it this way, or actually, let me do this is blarg, so I have a. Yes, I do need to press push. Thank you. See what happened there? I can, I can essentially create a link to a certain point in my file by using a regular expression pl uh, plumbing event. So I can link to a certain position in a file just by specifying colon, caret, regular expression. Very slick. Here's another one. I'm curious about Acme itself. And I know that there's two different Acme man pages. There's an Acme man page that's the description of how to execute it. And there's an Acme man page that talks about the philosophy of Acme. So if I type Acme colon, or, you know, and in, inside parentheses four, which is the, the, you know, the syntax of use section four of the manual, if I right click on that, it pops open in a new buffer, the Acme man page. Now, plumbing is something that you can do, and basically you tell it a list of rules. If you see this string, do that. You write your own rules in text. You can make it do whatever you want. I made it uh, open PDF files in preview if I'm on Mac and in events if I'm on Linux. So I, I make a, I've got a different plumbing rule set if I'm on uh, Mac as opposed to the plumbing rule set if I'm on uh, Linux. And if I see a PDF and I right click on PDF, uh, on foo.pdf, it opens it in the appropriate application, which is pretty slick. You can go a lot further with this, like uh, URLs get opened in your web browser, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of cool stuff there. I'm going to execute Dell on a couple of these just so that I can clean my screen up a wee bit. I'm interested, but I have to leave. All right, you're welcome to leave. I um, hope you can take some time and, and look at it a little later. Um, let's go a little further along, along now and talk about win. Well, I just mentioned win, so right? It's a, uh, it's a buffer. The downside to win is that Acme does not have any idea how to do character, or excuse me, terminal control codes. So the fancy color prompts that you're doing, the fancy uh, less, or grep dash dash color, they're gonna fill your screen with gobbledygook. So what you need to do is you need to create a special if terminal equals nine term, make sure everything does not do color. I've got these in my dot files. Unfortunately, they're not yet in my dot files repo. I'll get them in there this weekend or, or this next week and it'll be in this presentation, a link to it. So when you get to the uh, presentation.goosebach.com, uh, you'll have a link to those if you want it. So basically what I do is I go through in any command that I use regularly, I uh, create an alias for it to the no color option. Makes it a little cleaner. And I also modify the output of grep to be plum friendly. 
If you use the Plan 9 uh, port version of grep, it's done automatically, but I use the, the Mac OS version of grep, which it uses a space between the colon and the name, and I <laughs> suck that, that space up so that I get the, the, uh, the line number that's plumb friendly. So I can plumb through grep and, and you know, run grep in my win and right click and boom, it's ready to roll. Um, so it's a shell running in a buffer, very fun stuff. Uh, it allows you to do things such as sending. So um, instead of typing out an, a big long command, you can, uh, it's a middle click, I believe, that does send inside of Windows. But that's advanced. Again, Acme is a programmer's interface. What does this mean? It means that we can manipulate Acme by using file manipulation. So let's go back to our thing. Um, again, going back to Plan 9, Plan 9 is a network agnostic file system. Everything in Plan 9, every file activity happens over a protocol called 9P, or 9P2000 to be specific even if it's local or remote. What that means is that you don't know if your file is on this machine or halfway across the country. It's network agnostic, it's a distributed environment. As a matter of fact, your CPU may be different than your disk in this directory than in the other. So if you go into another directory uh, or another namespace, you may be in a different machine or a different uh, file server. So that being said, if we get into the the interface behind Acme, the Acme namespace is what it's called. It's a bunch of files. I've actually used 9P Fuse, the, the file systems for user space uh, on Mac, to mount the Acme namespace under slash MNT slash Acme. There's a couple of bugs, so you're gonna see some oddities here, uh, but you're gonna see that there's a, uh, a simple little directory structure You've got a directory with a number in it, a bunch of numbered directories. Each of those corresponds to one of these buffers. If I want to create a new buffer, let's bring our uh, window over here. cd slash mnt slash acme. a little bit easier to see. There we go. Um, watch what happens when I go into new. Actually, let's... Uh, Clean up a little bit so you can see exactly what this is doing. All right, so we have just the, sh the terminal here. Scroll down just a bit. I'm in slash MNT slash Acme. There's only the window nine left because I closed all those other buffers, right? If I go into new, and redirect it to the body, hmm. it's supposed to be creating me a new window. For some reason that doesn't seem to be working. All right, this is, a, this is one of those bugs that I mentioned with the um, using the 9P fuse. There's a bugs in the fuse interface, and so that's what's causing us grief. Uh, I'm going to just use 9P directly. 9P LS Acme. 9P LS Acme, or actually 9P right Echo High. Pipe it through 9P 
right to Acme New Body. And that pulls open a new window. Just by putting file into a pseudo file, that, that new directory doesn't really exist. But when it does, it puts it in here. So echo high, 9p right, Acme New Body. Put the string high into the body of this newly created window. And the file descriptor for that new, when you go into that directory, is the new window ID of whatever you're using. So the inode for that uh, you can use again to do things. Um, just some really cool, crazy stuff you can do with this. So you can imagine the fun that you can have. Um, let's do um, 9PLS Acme. And there's a window 12. So that was the new window we created. 9PLS Acme 12. And I want to do 9P read Acme 12. Oops, I did not mean to do it that way. 9P read Acme 12 tag is what I wanted. And you're going to see that it says 9P del, um, del snarf undo put look. Let's try this. Let's do echo a tag to pipe 9P right Acme 12 tag. That puts a new command. This is actually a script that I've written that's in my path called a tag. And the link to it is a little later on in the presentation. So it's a script that I've written that knows about Acme's namespace. This script is actually a tool that I use to keep my tag synchronized with what my project needs it to be. I execute it, and it replaces my tag with all the stuff that I want to do. So uh, there's some things that I want to use, like if I'm, and my a tag content changes based on the context. So uh, let's say that I was editing a Wiki to Beamer article. I've written these scripts that sit in my path called plus plus code, plus plus side, that basically just interact with the, the Acme window that they've been called from. So I do a, a, right, a, a middle click on plus plus code, and it takes what I highlighted and wraps it in code. I can do plus plus side, plus plus slide, and it puts a dummy slide in for me there. All of these are available on the GitHub. You'll see a link to them in just a second. We'll get into this in a little bit more in detail in just a minute. So that's the reason, that, well, there's the link right there, Acme Tools. Um, there's the reason that it's a programmer's interface. I can make it do what I need to based on the context of what I need it to, ha to have happen. Combining the power of plumbing with just touching files. You don't have to, there's no API. Well, there is an API. It's the file system. The file system is the API to Acme. Everything that Acme itself does is just a wrapper over the file system commands. So that put command is actually just executing, send this string into the control file, and it does it. Very, very powerful, very, very useful. How am I doing on time? Five more minutes? OK. Um, the, uh, let me show you a little bit. Are, are there any questions before I go any, any further here um, about Acme itself? Anything we've covered thus far? Well, it seems to me it's a little bit, um, pardon me, but it seems a little convoluted after you go through the process of actually queuing up the team notes and stuff like that. It was a really convoluted process of installing Plan 9 and working back and forth between Plan 9 file system and uh, you could just you know, a lot of setup to it. It's just text, and that was a, that's, that's to enable the power, right? It's, it's, it's not very pretty, I'll give you that. So the comment was that it's kind of convoluted to go through the, jump, the hoops to, to get it installed and whatnot. And that's actually a, um, 
That's an artifact of it coming from Plan 9, which the underlying architecture is so different. The, the paradigm is so vastly different that there's a lot of shimming that has to take place. Uh, to avoid that, just in, uh, because I'm doing um, uh, Acme under Plan 9 port, I have to jump through a, an extra hoop or two with that 9P instead of just using Fuse or whatever. And that's, that's a Fuse bug, that's not a 9P bug. So Acme doesn't have anything, any say over that at all. Um, the, uh, the easier way of doing that is just to use the standalone complex version uh, if you don't want any of the rest of the user land tools. I'm using some of the rest of the user land tools, so I, I, I prefer to use Plan 9 Ports version. Okay, and using SAC, does using SAC get you out from under having to worry about Fuse at all? Uh, you're still going to interface with Fuse, but uh, really, um, yes and no. So uh, using SAC going to get you away from having to interface with Fuse. It depends if you're going to try to do this advanced interface through the file system. And it basically it just defaults to 9P being easier than trying to set up Fuse and debug the Fuse bugs. Uh, and it's, it's really, it's, it's a simple script called 9P, and it's 9P right. There's five, there's five operations. So it's, 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 it's a lot, it looks a lot more complicated than it is, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, let me explain to you a couple of the things that I've done with my Acme tools. Um, it's on GitHub. I've got a library. I'm going to look at plus plus code. And uh, it's actually a sim link to um, the plus plus command. So each of these is a sim link uh, that points to this one command so I didn't have to write the command over and over and over again. And then it looks in the library to know what the content is it needs to wrap. So kind of an interesting architecture. It's written in bash. You all see that okay? Let's make it a little bigger. Um, so this is plus plus and then the sim link name knows what it's supposed to look for. So basically this is all of my um, boilerplate code that I put in every bash script that I write uh, that makes it a little easier to work with. And uh, if we come down a little bit, we get into the actual um, content there. Uh, what it's going to do here is it's going to read the content of the name, it's going to run a sed command, and it's going to read standard in. So it takes standard in, runs said for replace me, and then spits it to standard out. The script itself has no idea that it's being run under Acme. This script doesn't, anyhow. The uh, thing that it does is because there's a little pipe here at the beginning of it, what that says is, take what I've highlighted, put that into standard in, take the output and put it back here. I can modify that a little bit if I were to do something like this and highlight this word and then change this pipe to a greater than. If I hit, uh, let me make this just a bit bigger so you can see the output. If I hit execute on this, middle click, right? The standard out is not going, the standard in is still going to the script. Standard out is no longer going back to this buffer. It comes back to this special buffer that's called plus errors. So anything that's not explicitly redirected, reject, uh, redirected back into the buffer goes into the error console of Acme. Right? It's just a file in the Acme directory called plus errors, yeah. Well, it's a little different than that. I mean, it does have a directory there, and you can control the window, but you don't need to fiddle with it yourself. Um, if I do it the other way, with a less than, what's going to happen is that there's not going to be any standard input. It's just going to take the output of that command and put it into my screen. So it's going to actually replace gargle splat with a blank code stanza. 
as opposed to wrapping it as it would do if it were piped. Does that make sense? So pipe says standard in and standard out are glued to this buffer. Greater than is standard in comes from the buffer, goes through the script, standard out comes over here. Less than says no standard in, but the output comes back into here. Kind of a cool little trick for running our scripts. Put them in your path and you know, it's good to go. Um, I've got a couple of other Acme tools that I have written. Uh, one of them is called APASS. There's a bash script called Passive Voice. I do a lot of writing and I am a horrible linguist. I use passive voice. I have a lot of lexical illusions. Have you ever seen a lexical illusion? The, the, brown, fox. So it's, it's the the, the, and the a, a. That's a lexical illusion. Your eyes don't see it when they're together. A computer can see that real easy. So I wrote some scripts, passive voice, weasel words. So if you're doing, if you're doing a paper, you don't want to do, many of us believe, right? You want to be, you don't want to be passive and you don't want to have weasel words. So I've written Acme scripts that wrap bash scripts that a guy wrote to check all three of those things. So if I, let me uh, bring this guy up, we'll delete this column. We will, let's go ahead and delete this window as well. And then we will do a new one. I'm going to show you how to, how to browse files here. How am I doing on time? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Ten minutes? All right. I'm just entering a path here. Also, um, tab, if you're used to using tab to do completion, you're not going to get that in Acme. Um, that's the thing that's been the hardest for me. You can do file name completion if you hit Control F. So I've been bouncing this out with Control F to get file name completion. Presentations, capital A, Control F, example, Control F. Now I put a git in here and I execute it. And now this is a file browser buffer. So all I did is I put a directory name at the beginning and then manually entered and executed the git command and now this is a file browser. I'm going to right click on this bash-app directory and it opens the new window with the directory of the bash-app directory. So that's how I can browse through directories, find files very easily. If I find a file I want to edit, I right click on its name and it pops it open. So here we have a story.md. So it's just a markdown file with a bunch of stuff. Um, here's the lexical illusion. Who of you saw that right away? No, no one? Well, lucky for us, I can run the a tag command. And then there's a source file that says that this is a writing directory. Use the writing directory uh, stuff in my tag. And that gives me the, um, the code, slide, no wiki, and the a pass, a lexi, and a wheeze. So I want to double check the, uh, that this file doesn't have any weasel words, and it doesn't have any um, passive voice, and it doesn't have any uh, lexical illusions. So what I do is I right click on it and what that does is it pits over here in the, in the plus errors, right? There's a plus errors. It said this long file name, and it's really hard to read so I'm going to scoot it over just a bit. This long file name on line 20 has the line were swept. That's a weasel word. Or excuse me, passive. That's a passive word were swept. So if I right click on it, remember it's plumbing. Many things were swept under the rugs. So let's do, um, 
we just triggered the passive voice filter, we will click. I'm not going to click put intentionally. I'm going to back and go to um, uh, execute a pass. It says saving the file. It ran put for me. And it ran the contents of the file through the passive voice tool. And the passive voice tool said no passive voice found. Let me show you what that one looks like. A pass. <coughs> All right. I've got some bash libraries that I've written that wrap up that 9p uh, command. And I can just do, is Acme running? And it'll fail if not. And then give me the Acme window. And then uh, I can do if passive voice and the SAM file variable, which is some of the, was one of the things that Acme sets as it sends this data around. It's how you get the, the access to it. So this is the file name. It'll exit with zero if it passes, or it'll say no passive voice found. So what is the, the actual logic behind this? Well, let's look at the library. Library. Acme tools, main lib, and basically it says, you know, is Acme running? Yes, if 9p ls Acme returns. Test Acme running says if, if Acme is running, we don't do anything, but if it's not, we're going to exit. We don't want the script to do anything else if it's not running. Create a new Acme window and get the actual, like, the real number of the window, so you can then fiddle with it. Um, get the Acme uh, mount point. You can put a window. So basically it says, uh, give me a, this is the thing that, that ran put on my buffer. So I, Acme put window um, says, hey, save the file, and then go on, right? And then Acme clear tag is just doing a simple command called clear tag, which gets sent to the actual control file of that window, empties the tag out, and then we can reiterate whatever we want later on. So there's some variables that you can use that, that the shell scripts will set, some environment variables, and you use those to interact with your, your window numbers and the actual contents of the file through the file and system interface. All of this is up on GitHub if you want to look at it at your own perusal. Um, it's linked in the, in the presentation as well. Let me look, show you a little bit about how uh, their others work. Uh, lexical illusions. On line two, there's an A. Oh, hey, sure enough, right there. Then uh, let's do weasel words. Um, are a number. I'm just going to take that out. Trip up the weasel words filter. And then we will do weasel words. Last thing you need to know how to do, and that is searching within your buffer. Pardon me. Searching within your buffer is done the same way that you do plumbing. That's why mouse button three is overloaded quite a bit. In your tag, if you right click, uh, if, if you middle click, it tries to execute the command. If you right click, it uses what's known as the look command. So the look command is what's going to do your searching through your, your directory for that string. I'm going to put another to do right there in the middle. But up here on my tag, if I right click, it goes from where the cursor was down the file and puts the, highlights it and puts my cursor on it. I right click again, and it'll move me to the next one and then cycle back through the file. So right clicking is how I can search. Highlight something in the buffer, right click. It doesn't find another instance of canoe, but uh, I'm curious for all the A's, and it'll iterate through all the A's. Right? So that's searching. You can also do uh, a bunch of other things. Um, the, uh, 
Acme has a, a regular expression type engine, so you can do a global search and replace. Um, and of course, if you want to, you can just pipe things through any command that's on your system. You use the pipe command and uh, you know, pipe it through sed, pipe it through your, um, your uh, pretty printer. Perhaps you have an enforced coding standard, right? And you've got, you've got some sort of, what's the, what's the word they use for that? The um, lint, right? You've got a lint system of some sort for your source code. You can, uh, you can pipe it through your lint command. Or you could write a wrapper that has a command that just looks at it. Right. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Um, right. Is there a uh, repository of scripts that run? Is there a repository of scripts that run? Unfortunately, there's not a central repository of those scripts. Um, your best bet, however, is uh, to use the nine fans mailing list. Uh, there's a searchable archive of the nine fans mailing list. You search for Acme. Uh, you're going to find a gob of little things like that. I'll, I'll make sure there's a link to that. Uh, there's not one on the presentation, but I'll make sure there's a link to that before I push it up today um, to the nine fans mailing list. Um, it's uh, like any very uh, esoteric open source style mailing list, it can be a little aggressive, rough at times, a little bit, uh, I don't want to say uncivilized. It must be on the internet. It's on the internet, yes. So it's, it's, it's a mailing list on the internet. So uh, plan accordingly, right? Um, or, 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 you know, put on your, your, your thick leather skin uh, gherkin before you, you get in there. Um, they are kind of gruff. It's, it's very much a, oh, you didn't look, although, or they'll respond with an answer that looks like this. Um, how do I do such and such in Acme? And they'll say, um, and the only response you will get is that. It is, which, yeah, and if you're, e if you're reading your email in Acme, all you have to do is right click and you've you got your, your answer. Um, actually, uh, the one thing that's really cool is <laughs> some of the more kind gentlemen there will actually put a, uh, a regular expression in here to get you to the right word in the man page that you need to, which is kind of cool. It's cool that you can plumb that way, right? Uh, but yeah, you had a, a question as well, Aaron? The question is, uh, when I was running the Plan 9 commands, were they running through a Plan 9 shell or a Mac shell? The answer is whatever your profile does. Uh, my dot files do some really magic stuff. Not magic, but um, custom stuff. Uh, I use a, um, I use bash, but by default, it will open RC which is the Plan 9 shell. Um, I use, um, again, I, do, I go through those hoops to strip all the color out of the commands just to make it easier on my life. And the uh, thing that's funny is uh, if we do, we'll, let's open up another window. Um, my prompt here, the command is W-I-N. I need to open a prompt window, is how I remember, is the mnemonic I use. Yeah, so I just right clicked on it, or excuse me, middle clicked on win, and it popped this up. Um, we know it's a, a buffer with, with a shell in it because it has a dash host name uh, ending on it. My PS1, plain text, none of the fancy escape codes, and it has this Unicode character in it, so it's two lines, and it has a Unicode character at the beginning. And I've also created a, a function with this name in my aliases, or in my dot files, that is a no-op. Why would I want to do that? So I can cut and paste the entire line and have it execute. So, so in my dot files, 
this character is a no-op so that I can cut and paste my entire line. And it's a two-line prompt as well for the same reason. All right. Um, any other questions? Any other comments? This qualifies? Yes. Um, the, the thing that I was told when I was learning Acme, and I've, I've got to put up a, a tile, I'll put up a slide of, of uh, additional info um, as well on this. The thing that I was told when I first learned Acme was think different. No, 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 no. Different er. No, you're still not think, thinking different enough. And it's, it's true. That learning curve is true. So, um, it's, it's definitely worth, worth, worthwhile. It took me two and a half, three weeks of forcing myself to use Acme before I got to the point that I wasn't missing Vim anymore. Uh, another question was, um, when you're working on code, is there any kind of highlighting or syntax highlighting at all? The answer is, is there any syntax highlighting? And the answer is no. And that is because of science. Literally, like, syntax highlighting gets in your way. It's, it's the, it's the uh, this is a, kind of a dictate of syntax highlighting is sugar for your brain and it's not good for you. You, sh you need to write simpler code, essentially is the answer. Sometimes you're stuck using the frameworks and tools you're, you're on. I would really like syntax highlighting, but write simpler code is the answer. Um, that you're going to get from the Plan 9 guys and the Acme guys anyhow. Again, contact me, gooseback.com slash contact. Uh, Presentation.gooseback.com is not yet live. Still have to add the A record to my DNS, um, but it'll be there uh, this weekend. Uh, and it'll have this presentation, including the actor, actor action report that uh, I promised you guys. I promised you guys a, a list of resources I promised you the dot files, and was there another thing? I think that was it, right? All right, well, thank you very much. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.
When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler, faster, and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. 
you have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center, uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago. Uh, and, you know, it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication from Wicked.